www.meetradio.com. This is Joe Larson, and you're watching the 505 on Racing Show. If it's your first time viewing, welcome. I understand we have some first time viewers on tonight watching, and uh, it's a, it'll be an interesting show tonight. I want to thank, uh, I want to start this show off. I want to thank the people at Orange County Fair Speedway in Middletown, New York, for their gracious hospitality this past weekend. I had uh, traveled uh, upstate to the fairgrounds to Watch some dirt track racing. I haven't seen dirt track racing in about four or five years, and the last time was Volusia County down there in Speed Weeks. And um, the, my gracious host, Ken Sands, the operations manager, uh, basically gave me the keys to the place. And, and I want to thank them and his staff for everything they did. And uh, we're, we're going to probably be talking with Ken later on in the show, but uh, I'll tell you what, when, when the media goes to, and, and, and my media, I, yeah, yeah, well, I guess. But when a media goes to a racetrack, those are the people you need to be nice to, be good to. And, and not because they deserve it, and not because you want to make an impression, because you want to show them how you run your racetrack. And I'll tell you what, I've been, as we know, we've talked about this, I've been to many, many racetracks across this continent, not just the country, Canada, Mexico as well. And, and I'll tell you what, when, when you handed the keys to the place, basically, I mean, there was not a place that I couldn't go in this facility. There wasn't a place that I couldn't talk to anybody, and there wasn't a place where my money was any good. They took really good care of me, and I appreciate that. And it's things like that will keep me coming back to that. And you know what? Not only did they do that to me and, and my, my camera crew, but they also did it to their fans, and that's important a very fan-friendly facility, competitive. I mean, I was at the back end. You know, you get an idea and you get a feel for how the night's going to be sometimes just by standing at the back gate when the teams are coming in, they're signing in, they're, they're picking for their spots or their, you know, the handicapper and, you know, their little talk. And I, and I watched the teams come in and the camaraderie and the the joking and the the friendliness. There was not one race team that came through that gate, whether it was the, the, the defending champion last week's winner or the rookie who never showed up there before. There was not one person that didn't walk through there with a smile on his face, joking around with the handicapper, the operations manager, the race director, who happens to be all the one the same guy. The sign-in people, great people. Uh, I, I was VIP. and. Um, it felt good. It felt good to, 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 to go through that and experience that. Like I said, I haven't been to a dirt track in a long time. And, and even then, when I went to Volusia, I went to that dirt track as a fan. I sat in the grandstands and, and just watched the races. But I was behind the scenes. And, and I didn't realize what it takes to prepare a dirt track to go racing. I know what it takes to, to prepare an asphalt track, and, but a dirt track, grading and pounding and more grading and tearing up and grading and adding water and calcium chloride to keep the dust down and more and more and and it rained it rained towards the end we didn't get the last two features in but it when i'm saying then go oh it's a dirt track well, well, <laughs> you just wait for the rain to stop going oh no because then the whole process to prep the track had to be done all over again and once the, the track got this glaze on it i was told once it glazed over, the track was lost, and the night was lost. So again, my thanks to Ken Sands and his staff at Orange County Fair Speedway for what they did for 
my crew, Kevin Basic and myself, what they did for us to make us feel not only welcome, but to make us want to come back again. And, and, and that's important. And, and they didn't do that, so I gave them a positive talk on this show. They did that because that's what they do. And, and their car counts show it, and, their, and the people in the seats, they show, we walked around talking to the people. It, it was just, the atmosphere was just such that, that it was, it was like everybody was family. And it was a good time. And, and it wasn't that long of a trip. It was only a couple hours. And, and I'll tell you why. And I, Mike Gravel Buscom, my buddy, you know, he goes up there and, and competes in demolition derbies. And I was like, why would you go all the way up there? It's not all the way up there. Somebody once told me, why do you say it all the way there? It's, it's not that far. And, and it wasn't. So it was, it was all good. And we'll, we'll talk more about that later on. And, but I, I didn't want to start my show without thanking them and, and, and how appreciative I am of them. To, to let me come in and, and do what I do. And basically, I like to watch races, but I got to do some stuff for, for the show, for the 505 on show, for, in radio, and, and it's good. And, and, and radio.com, you know, we're broadcasting to the world, and, and, and we are. And, and I went to the other side, I'm an asphalt guy. And you know, went and did some dirt stuff, and there was more, I got an education. There was more to doing dirt track racing than I thought. So, um, uh, and then, and as, as uh, Walter Johnson says, you can get there in 90 minutes. Yeah, and 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 I was driving somebody else's car, so I wasn't, you know, being my my old normal, put the metal pedal to the metal and go, just taking it nice and easy. Wasn't a lot of traffic going, and it was a Saturday morning, so again, had a great time, great time. Anyway, NASCAR, so we talk about a lot. I read the racing papers. I go into websites. I look, I read, I look at pictures, who won, who, who didn't win, what went on. And, and, and I want to get, I want to say this because it's important to me right now. And, and I think if you're a race team and, and you're out there and you do the victory lane thing, there's, there's something that a wise man once told me. It was a sponsor and um, he had rules. This guy had rules for his sponsorship. And they weren't crazy rules, but the guy's paying the bills on your race car and you do what he says, basically, unless it goes against your religious or moral um, beliefs or could injure yourself. And this is what I see in these, these pictures. And it's all great and good. The guy wins a feature event. It's all excited. Everybody comes out for the picture. And where do they all stand? In front of the car. The car facing the camera. Now, as a person who does sponsorships and find sponsors for race teams. Hey, it's all great, it's all well and good. You wanna recognize your team, your crew, people who might have want, helped you work on the car, somebody who's passing by your shop, saw the cars, oh, I know that guy wanna be in a picture, little kids in the grandstand, it's all good. Go behind the car. Let the sponsors be seen. Let that quarter panel, that's usually one of your biggest sponsors, the guy that's under the rear window, let that be shown. The ones that are on the fender, let that be shown. Let that be in the picture. They don't need to see from your waist down. They need to see your face. Stand behind the race car. Now you take that picture, and then you can get that picture out to, to your sponsors who are visible in the picture. They're looking for recognition. They're looking for return on their sponsors of dollars. We've talked about that a hundred times, but they're looking for that recognition. And they want to be able to hold that picture or hang that picture in their office, in their business, in their shop, in their living room or den, wherever they hang their pictures, and have a victory lane shot with their driver holding a checkered flag with their logo or name on the car. I, I don't understand that. that you know, we're, we're quick as drivers and owners to take that money. And we're quick as drivers and owners to spend that money. But why aren't we cognizant enough to say, hey, I want that guy to be in a picture, you know, his logo. Yeah, I've seen people, you know, the drivers going, and they oh, hey, come on, come on, you know, you're on this car, come. And we, again, where do they stand in front of everything? You don't even see the car. Some of these teams, it's, it's, I laugh about this. Some of these teams, you know, they, they have a pit crew of like two, but they win a feature event, and all of a sudden, 20 people are in that picture. I remember saying one time, I said, I said, if I ever win a race, I said, in my shop, it's just me and my buddy. Me and my buddy. I ever win a race, I bet you there'd be like 30 people in the picture. 
There's people that jump out of the grandstand just so they can say they walked on a racetrack, you know? Anyway, now speaking of the chat room, um, <laughs> I, I see some people, you know, kind of not happy about this chat room. This will be the last week of this chat room because as one person says, this chat room is not good. Um, and uh, and uh, <laughs> I'm getting, but, you know, the control room talks to my ear and sometimes they say things like that, that I can't say, I gotta ring the bell. But um, so, so bear with it, but one more time on this, one more time. And uh, tonight I, I, I ran outside to send some messages out to people. We had some stream issues and that's why we started late. Uh, some technical issues, and, and I'm not a techie guy. They explained to me what happened. As far as I can know, it was, we didn't go on. I was sitting here, I was sitting there waiting, but there was some tech issues, and the control room were pulling out the hair and throwing headsets and stuff, and uh, hoping that would fix it, but, but it was able to get <laughs> fixed. So uh, it, it's all good now, so apologies. Uh, but uh, yeah, there were some issues with the, the chat room, and, and, and I know I don't want to take up too much valuable time on it, but uh, this will be the last week of this format. And uh, next week's format, I'm not sure what it will be, but I'm sure they will share that with me and I will get it out to everybody. And uh, I, well, I think we're going back to almost what we had. If, uh, pretty similar, right, the control room? Yeah, it'll have all the same features as the old one uh, and be a little bit more user friendly. So, uh, uh, so whatever, but uh, we'll, we'll, we'll make it happen. But uh, it's, uh, uh, I'm not in the chat room, so I don't have to experience it, but if, if you know, from last week's feedback and the feedback today, we, we already decided before we went live today that we weren't gonna use that chat room again. So um, this is the last, the last time for it. So anyway, uh, um, yeah, we, there was, there's no way for me to get in touch with anybody once I'm in the studio to say we're running late. So I, that's why I went outside. Uh, there was a couple of people I let know that I could, I'm not good with sending out broadcast messages to a group, so um, I'm, like I said, I'm not a techie guy. But anyway, that's, that's just how it is. And uh, again, apologies for, for today, but uh, well, uh, it, it's fixed, it's fixed. So uh, now we're getting suggestions on what to do <laughs> with the chat room, I'm loving it. <laughs> I'm loving it, this is great. Anyway, um, so anyway, so going back to this one, Remember, like, in, in, if, if you're involved with a team, you own a car, you drive a car, your buddy drives a car, your girlfriend drives a race car, truck, whatever, share that with them. It's, it, it's big, and, and, and I was talking to a sponsor who, not only was, did their driver win, their driver won a race, won a feature event, and it was a good picture, and when the picture was in the racing paper, the guy says to me, look at this, look at this right here. I sponsored that car, you never know it. I'm not even, A, I'm not even in the picture. There's all these people in the picture that have nothing to do with the race car and they're standing a block on my logo. Now think about when it comes time to renew that deal for next year. You don't think that's gonna be an issue? See, sponsors are, are very hard to get. But they're very easy to keep and very easy to lose. Think about that. There's not a lot of people that I know that could afford that go racing out of their pocket week after week, year after year. They, they depend on sponsors. And you need to make your sponsors happy. It's, you know, it's like having a spouse. You gotta keep your spouse happy. <laughs> so you don't keep your spouse happy, you're gonna lose your spouse. You don't keep your sponsors happy, you're gonna lose the sponsor. And then what happens? It gets real expensive, trust me. Believe me when I tell you. Anyway. Uh, oh, what's going on? What do we got going on? Waterford. Somebody's asking me I'm going to Waterford. That must be my, I guess, call him crew chief, even though we don't have a crew to chief. Um, Waterford, I don't know. Um, I don't know. I, I'm taking this, this racing gig week by week. I have a lot of stuff going on outside of racing, and uh, I'm, I'm going week to week with this. Um, so I, I, I don't know. Um, and um, we'll, we'll see, and, and, and I'm sure uh, 47331, which I think is, is, uh, is, uh, is my buddy, um, it, it's, it's uh, for the tour race, and, and, and um, we're, we're kicking it around. 
But when I say we're kicking around, me and the demons in my head, we're kicking around. So anyway, we'll see what happens. <laughs> uh, we'll see what happens. But um, anyway, so the NASCAR stuff. Um, another thing that, that I see, Steve O'Donnell, NASCAR Executive Vice President Steve O'Donnell, he's the and Chief Racing Development Officer um, announced that on, I said not that, on Sirius FM NASCAR radio, the competition offers are working to increase side-by-side -side racing and passing. They probably finally watched the race and, and watched it objectively and saw that this isn't good racing. Nobody wants to see a parade without music. Nobody wants to see single file, lap after lap. Nobody wants to see three by three by three by three, six rows you know, deep on the super speedways. They want to see passing. They want to see bumping and grinding. They want to see excitement. They don't want to, not, nobody wants to see crashes, but they want to see racing. And, you know, I, I look at, I was just watching, a, 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 what was I, I put in a tape I had from the Daytona 500 in 1988. I think it was 88 or 89, I'm watching it, and, and all of a sudden, I'm watching, I'm like, these guys are racing. They're racing. And they're not flat-footing it around the racetrack and just getting in the draft and riding the slipstream. They're racing, and they're passing people. And not only up front, in the middle of the pack, in the back of the pack, goes, nobody gets shuffled to the back. And I was looking at the first, like, oh, the guy's going to the outside. He's going to go. Oh, well, if that would have happened at Talladega or Daytona today, he's going to go to the outside. He's going to get shuffled backwards if one or two other cars don't go with him or her. You, back then, you, know, you didn't have a restrictor plate. You weren't flat-footing it. You, you, you had to race. You had to drive these race cars. You had to muscle them around. You had to fight the turbulence. I, I remember watching on a replay years ago when Dale Earnhardt Sr. was racing, and he got behind somebody with lap after lap after lap, and all of a sudden he just moved a little bit to the inside, and you saw the car from the air wiggle, the car in front of him wiggle. Nobody was better at making that happen than, than, than Dale, Dale Earnhardt Sr. You know? um, it, it was, it's, I don't know. And, and, and we're going to talk about that also, I'll race a little bit later in the results anyway. And, and what I watched of it, I, I did not like. I did not like it. It was, it was boring. Um, it was a boring, boring race. Uh, I, I didn't like the segment format. I, I know that was to make excitement. And again, I'm not, I'm not knocking NASCAR. I'm just speaking as, as a fan. And, 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 and I'm not only speaking for me as a fan. And other people might disagree with me. But I, I don't know. It, was, it just wasn't an interesting race to me. It, it really wasn't. And it was a lot of money on the line. I remember some of those old all-star races that they had. It was more excitement, and it was a little more crazy, a little more wild. So anyway, we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit later. We're going to take a break now, and we'll do for our break. And uh, when we come back, um, we're going to have some more on the Orange County Fair Speedway in Middletown, New York, when we come back. <laughs> It's Christmas Dick, and if in radio.com spots you at an event wearing this bracelet, they will give you $100. The world of advertising has changed. Radio, TV, and newspaper revenues have declined drastically. Why? Because businesses have realized that advertising return on investment isn't what it used to be. So what can we do about it? Well, that's easy. Advertise online. Own a local restaurant, real estate agency, or even a national retail chain? Whatever your business, Inravio can get your message out there, and we can do it at a fraction of the cost. Call today and see the difference for yourself. This isn't TV. This isn't radio. This is Inravio.com.
I'm Raul Panther. And I'm Commander B. Hawkins. And I'm Mark Willen. We're uh, some of the proto men. If we see you without this bracelet, we're going to punch in the d But if you have this bracelet from inradio.com, you can win 100 bucks. Put one of these on or else. For over 60 years, Hanson Carpet has put the customer first, providing only the finest quality products and service. And Hanson Carpet is so much more than just carpet. We also carry a wide selection of window blinds and shades, and our licensed and insured technicians can service any of your flooring or window covering needs. Browse our huge selection of laminate, carpet, linoleum, vinyl, and tile. Stop by our showroom today or visit HansonCarpet.com. No matter what your project, Hanson Carpet has got you covered. I was reading an article in Area Auto Racing News, uh, I believe it's uh, Steve Smith's Roaming the Raceways. And he had some valid points in regards to uh, a track. Now, for those who don't know, he, he travels the country, the continent, going to racetracks, and he writes a little blurb about the racing activities. Now, I'm not going to say which track he wrote about, but what I'm going to say is this. He was, and, I'm, and I want to say he was negative, because he... he he was honest, and, it, and if some people take honesty as negativity, so be it. But one of the things that, and, and if you're a racetrack promoter, PR person, whatever you are in your racetrack and, and you're involved with some of the publicity parts, your website and what your people say at the back gate got to match. And I know, I know some people that went through that at, at New Smyrna that they were told one thing and they get to the racetrack, it's another thing. But, but one of the things this individual, was, Steve Smith had said, was that when he called the office, he was told the start time was a certain time. When he went to the website, he was told the start time was a different time. And when he got to the racetrack, he was told that the races started at a certain time. And when he got into the racetrack, he realized he missed qualifying because they didn't say that's when qualifying was. The other issue that was brought to mind is that it was a cold night, and they didn't speed up the show. They let it go, and they let it go, and they let it go. And fans, because it was getting cold and late, left. Now, going to some racetracks is not cheap. Uh, some, some, it's just, it's not cheap. So you go there, and, and, and I always used to say this at my local racetrack years ago, because that was one of the discussions I had, that why are we saying that the show starts at 6.30? It really doesn't, because we were starting to qualify at, at 4, or whatever it was at the time. So it's like going to the circus. Let's say you want to go to the circus. It's a three-win circus. You go, and they say that it starts at 8 o'clock. But at 7 o'clock, they had an elephant show. that You missed it. You wanted to see the elephant show. So all I'm saying is the tracks, and, and I agree with what Steve wrote in his column, the, the Roman the raceways, the, an area auto, the, everything's got a job. Anyway, on the phone, I believe, we have Ken Sands, operations manager for Orange County Fair Speedway. He was very gracious to uh, treat, treat me and my staff like gold this weekend. Uh, Ken, you out there? Yeah, I'm here. How you doing? I'm doing great. Uh, Ken, again, I, I want to publicly thank you and your staff for the treatment we received at your facility this past Saturday night. Hey, not a problem. You're welcome anytime. Thank you. Thank you. You know, I, asphalt racing, dirt racing, two separate things that we talked about. People think you just put the key in the gate and open the fence and go. I didn't realize what your staff does to make the track ready for racing. And uh, maybe you could tell us briefly, uh, what's involved with getting a dirt track ready to go racing? Well, first of all, the weather has to be cooperative. I, I, you obviously know that we had a little issue with rain on, on Saturday night, but um, uh, we, it starts all week long. We have to dig the dirt up, uh, and then uh, toward the end of the week, we start laying some calcium down and some water down and some more calcium down and water. Um, you don't want to overwater it but you need it to be uh, 
a tacky surface, but you also want the calcium down to keep the dust down so it doesn't become dusty so you can't see cars. Now, and then they have to pack then they have to pack it in and pack it in and keep packing it until it until it becomes a raceable racing surface. Right. Now I, I, I walked on the track of afterwards and man it was it was as solid as a rock and, and I didn't expect that. <laughs> I mean you know, and watching the grader when earlier in the day when I'm like, why is he tearing the racetrack up? But like you said, it was to pack it down. And and how long does that take? I'm sorry. How long does it take to get the, a track ready from the from the moment that the, the equipment hits the track to it's race ready? How long does that take you? On uh, on the, on the Saturday, it takes. Uh, he starts early in the morning, and it takes a couple hours uh, to get it race ready. Um, probably four or five hours on the Saturday. And and you don't just do this on Saturday. They, your guys are working during the week as well, correct? Right, right. They're working during the week. Uh, uh, you know, we're we're going around. Sometimes the rocks surface through the through the track, so you have to pick the rocks out and uh, and fill in any major holes that you get. And then you just work the dirt. Now, one of the things I noticed, Ken, in walking around your facility and, and spending that time at the back gate with you, and then walking around the, the pit area as well, I noticed the friendliness of an interaction between your staff, your, your, your competitors, and also the fans. What do you attribute that to? Well, um, I, don't, I really don't know the answer to that, uh, other than uh, that the racing people are, uh, uh, everybody in racing is a family, and we all help each other out, although it's the competitiveness is there, but uh, it's, you know, it's, it's important that everybody gets along and, and you know, even in a family, you have arguments. So it does happen. But majority of the time, everybody helps everybody else out, and uh, it's just a family atmosphere. And that's what you want, and that's what that's what brings the fans, the on hands where they can meet the drivers and greet the drivers, and, and you know, they're just regular people to the fans. Yeah, and, and and I saw that. I was I was impressed by that. And you know, I don't I don't impress easy, and I was very impressed by that. <laughs> <laughs> and I, like I said, I'm going to say this a hundred times. I had such a great time with that. Now, the other thing that, that I wanted to ask you too. Now, you know, you had a, a, a nice car count. I don't know if that was more than usual, less. Than, what is your, your your car count for your modified and, and sports and divisions on average on a weekly Saturday? Uh, on average, on a Saturday day with uh, with our big blocks, our small blocks, our sportsmen, and our street stocks, it's a little over a hundred cars, and we probably were in that ballpark on. Uh, this past Saturday. That's a hundred. So that's that's basically what three divisions and a hundred cars. Yeah, roughly. Yeah. Yeah, and I know you have some special shows going on now. And I remember um, just from reading the, the racing papers, you were involved with the the DIRT, the Dirt Series. Now they're no longer yeah. affiliated with, with uh, I guess, with you for at least for this season. Um, this season we we went independent. Right. Um, now. It's a lot of our guys, um, although the rules are the same, we still follow the dirt rules. Mm -hmm. But we just don't. We're just not a member of the dirt series. Right, and and we were talking about that a little bit, and, and people don't realize that the cost that's involved with being part of a sanctioning body such as that, and, and you know, we, we don't need to get into the numbers here, but I was surprised that that's what it cost you to be involved with that, and you know, and, and I guess it's the same on, on on the NASCAR side too. There's a a lot of money that a promoter or or a racetrack has to pay to a sanctioning body for that name and the use of that name and, and the sanctioning. Um, right. Moving that forward, do you still you plan on staying as an independent facility at the, at the present time? Uh, yes, that's our plans, yeah. Okay, now, and, and it didn't seem to hurt your, your car counts from, from what it looked like. You're still, the, the competitors are still there and then the teams are still there. Right, right. It's, it, it, it hasn't really hurt the car count at all. You mean you, you might have lost one or two, but the one or two that you lost, you picked up some more. So. Well, yeah, I call that addition by subtraction sometimes. <laughs> right, right. Now, I, I, there was a little, we had a clip up before and, and, and that showed the, the, the headstone, and we didn't get a, a chance to talk about that. There's a headstone right outside your office. Um, yes. E explain that to the, to the folks that are listening, because you do it better than I do. Uh, well, way back in the day when the uh, track was first built, it was a horse track before it became a, a car racing. In, uh, the track was built in 1857. It went to automobiles in 1919. But in the, in the, while it was the horse racing, there was a, 
famous horse, I guess is the best way to describe it, whose name was Harry Clay. And when the car track became, I mean, when the track became a car track, they named it the Harry Clay Oval in memory of the horse who was buried at the fairgrounds uh, where the headstone is, obviously. Uh, so that's the story behind Harry Clay when, and when the I headstone was, and, and the horse. When I was walking into your office, I said, and I saw the headstone, I thought it was like a memorial stone for like, the man who built the place. <laughs> so, and then you went and told me, hey, horse. it's the horse. And, you know, people say he's still under the building making noises. So. <laughs> yeah, every now and then you hear a kick. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, but, I don't know that it's the horse, but I'm not taking no chances. Uh, that, uh, looking forward, what, what, what events you got planned or coming up that you'd like to share with our viewers and listeners? Well, this week we have off. So we, we're taking off for Memorial Day. Everybody, take, We take a break once in a while. You, know, you need it just to... Uh, you know, to, just to have time for the racers to have some time with their family. But we got a big event coming up in the beginning of June. It's Nostalgia Night, where we invite a lot of the drivers from the past to come back to do an autograph session. We usually get around 55, 60 former drivers who have raced through the years at the Speedway. And uh, that's, that's the next big event that we have. And then, of course, at the end of the year, we have the Eastern States, which is the Oh, shit. 54th year, I think that that is. Wow. And it's it's one of the oldest uh, big events in the country, too. Yeah, Our track is the oldest in the United States. Yeah, and, and one of my, in fact, my first event that I appeared, or showed up to watch the races was 1977 for the Eastern States, and it left such an impression on me because uh, I never saw a dirt race live, and then I had gone five or six years consecutive after that, and then I just got involved with my, my NASCAR stuff. And uh, a great show. And, and do you have the dates of the Eastern States, Ken? Yes, it's October 23rd, 24th, and 25th. So It's a three-day event. So it started out as a one-day event back in 1962. Right. And then it became a two-day event. Now it's a three-day event. Wow. So which, is, which is enough. <laughs> three days. That's a Friday, Saturday, Sunday, right? Yes. Yes, it is. Well, can I? And we I, run. Uh, we run our regular divisions, uh, our modifieds, our small blocks, right. our sportsmen, our stocks, and sprint cars. We run on that weekend too. So. Now, you know, the other thing that that, that I was very impressed with at your racetrack is when I pulled in, I saw a sign. It said, "Drive in," and I was like, "I don't see a screen." And then when we were talking in your office, you said you pointed out there's an area that people could park their cars put the radio on, and it's up a hill, so the people in the back have the same view as the people in front. Tell us a little bit about the drive-in. Yes, it's, a, it's, it's based on a drive-in theater. Um, it's, it's, layer, it's, it's in layers, you know, it starts at the top and then it goes down, down, there's like, I think there's six or seven rows, but it holds around 300 cars, and you, you tune into a uh, radio station, which we have broadcasting from our uh, announcer's tower it's 107.7 and you can hear the radio over the radio you can hear the, what the announcers are saying because it's hard to hear when the cars are going around right with the PA system I mean it's even hard in the stands to hear you know right but um, it's it's unique because people can bring their kids you know and if the kids fall asleep they're in the car and you just yeah. drive them home you know it's not like if they're in the stands you got to carry them out to the car yeah yeah. And everything else is just, uh, and you can have your own little, you know, you set up a little barbecue grill and have your own little uh, tailgate party. Very fan friendly. I, I, I loved it. I, I'll tell you, I, I might go watch from race from out there one of these times when I go. Uh, now, Ken, I, no racetrack could operate without the help of not only good people but good sponsorship. Who are some of the companies and people that that help make your racetrack click? Well, we have um, we have uh, our our. Bigger sponsor this year is uh, Halmar Corporation, uh, Halmar International. Uh, then we have uh, Dana Distributors, which is a Budweiser distributor, um, and WLR Construction. Um, they uh, they help through the year, and and all these guys help these companies help out at Eastern States too, because our Eastern States race pays ten thousand dollars to win, mm -hmm. where a regular Saturday night pays only twenty five hundred to win. Right, only twenty five hundred. Yeah. And then there's a lot of little sponsors uh, that are out there, you know. Wow. <clears throat> but everybody, all, and all the cars have sponsors on them, and yeah. you know, every every dollar that comes in helps the drivers yep. out. Every dollar that comes into the racetrack. 
And, and, and like I said, you, not only is your track and, and facility fan friendly, it's also competitive friendly as well. And it, it seems like yeah. you have a, a, a friendly relationship with just about, uh, I'm going to say, everybody that I saw going through your back gate. It was a little exchange, a little, little laugh, a little chuckles, and you know, next. And, and it was like that for everybody, and, and, and that was great. Well, you try to be because, you know, without them, I don't have a job. Right. Without them, there is no racing. Yeah. So, I mean, and, and then you have to be on the other side of the fence sometimes where it comes down to a rules infraction that you have to penalize them mm -hmm. for or, or whatever, and they understand that. Yep. You know? well, all my years as an official, I used to tell the teams, it's your job to, bend it, to break that envelope, and it was my job to seal it. And as long as we have yep. that understanding, at the end of the day, we're still buds. That's, that's the way it is, and that's the way it has to be, unfortunately. Yeah. Well, Ken, uh, I know you're a busy guy, and I appreciate you taking the time out of your busy schedule to, to talk to us tonight. And, uh, and, and I'll tell you, I will be back to your facility. I had such a good time there, and I want to thank you no again. No problem. No problem. Just give me a holler, and, uh, you know, you're, you're welcome anytime. Thanks. Ken Sands, Operation Manager, Orange County Fair Speedway up in Middletown, New York. Thank you. We're going to take a break, and we come back, we'll talk about the All-Star Race in Charlotte. Guys, we're Scan Off Fair, and we're here with Enravio. If they catch you at a show with one of these bracelets, you will win a hundred bucks. That's a lot of money. So get a bracelet. Do whatever it takes to get that. Hit them up online. advertising has changed. Radio, TV, and newspaper revenues have declined drastically. Why? Because businesses have realized that advertising return on investment isn't what it used to be. So what can we do about it? Well, that's easy. Advertise online. Own a local restaurant, real estate agency, or even a national retail chain? Whatever your business, Enravio can get your message out there. And we can do it at a fraction of the cost. Call today and see the difference for yourself. This isn't TV. This isn't radio. This is Enravio.com. Hey, I'm, I'm Raul Panther. And I'm Commander B. Hawkins. And I'm Mark Well. We're uh, some of the proto men. If we see you without this bracelet, we get punched in the d But if you have this bracelet from nradio.com, you can win 100 bucks. Put one of these on, or else. For over 60 years, Hanson Carpet has put the customer first, providing only the finest quality products and service. And Hanson Carpet is so much more than just carpet. We also carry a wide selection of window blinds and shades, and our licensed and insured technicians can service any of your flooring or window covering needs. Browse our huge selection of laminate, carpet, linoleum, vinyl, and tile. Stop by our showroom today or visit HansonCarpet.com. No matter what your project, Hanson Carpet has got you covered. Hey, well, just one more quick thing about Orange County Fair Speedway. I want to thank Jay Kosh, um, modified number 47, for allowing us to put the uh, GoPro in his race car. Um, although uh, he, he was involved in a, in a, not a bad wreck, but his, his car got tore up pretty bad. <laughs> he was okay, thank goodness. But uh, so because of the wreck, we couldn't get any footage out of it. But I want to thank him for uh, putting that thing in and, and, and working with us with that. So anyway. All right, Charlotte, the all-star race at Charlotte. We talked about it. Boring. It was boring. It was a parade with no music. Uh, Denny Hamlin was the winner with Kevin, uh, Kevin Harvick uh, second. Kurt Busch third. Jeff Gordon was fourth. Matt Kenseth was fifth. Followed by Kyle Busch, Casey Kane, Joey Logano, Brad Keselowski, and Dale Earnhardt Jr. Um, the Xfinity Series was out in Iowa, a beautiful facility. I had the opportunity to work there a few times. Um, Chris Boucher was uh, the winner there, followed by Chase Elliott, Eric Jones, third, Ryan Scott, fourth, 
Ryan Blaney was fifth. Darrell Wallace Jr. was sixth, followed by Ben Rhodes. Uh, Brandon, and I, I, I have a problem with his name, Tewitt, Elliot Sadler, ninth, and Brendan Gaughan while rounded out the top ten. The K&M Pro Series had a combo race out there, east and west. Brandon McReynolds was the winner, William Byron second, Ronnie Bass Jr. was third, Jesse Little fourth, and Christopher Bell rounded out the top five there. The Camper World Truck Series was in Charlotte Friday night. Casey Kane was the winner there, followed by Eric Zones, Matt Crafton, Tyler Riddick was fourth, Brad Keselowski fifth, John West Townsley was sixth, Timothy Peters seventh, Matt Tiffett eighth, Justin Boston ninth, and Spencer Gallagher rounding out the top ten. Post race inspection found Casey Kane's uh, truck to be too low, and um, we'll find out what that penalty is tomorrow. NASCAR hands out all penalties after their competition conference call and meeting on Tuesdays. And it's also when they decide uh, from the weekly tracks what the penalties are going to be uh, to any competitors or crew members who violated any of the rules or uh, things of that nature. And I, I can remember having my conversations with Jerry Cook and, and uh, Joe Scott Nicky, who were my competition people back in the day in my day. And uh, you know, sometimes I, I want to give a driver or, or a crew guy, you know, X number of weeks and X number of a fine, and sometimes NASCAR maybe chop it down a little bit, and sometimes they maybe bump it up. Um, I think the, the the highest penalty I ever gave out, uh, wanted to give out to a, a weekly competitor was was a, a ten year suspension and a ten thousand dollar fine. And the funny thing about it was after I said that that's what I was going to do, before talking to NASCAR, that was a Saturday night there, that competitor came in with a check for ten thousand dollars, ready to pay it. And he was going to appeal the suspension. <laughs> so anyway, when we got down to it, and, and Jerry Cook had his little talk with me, and, and Joe was done with his hissy fit, um, uh, we knocked it down to like, like a week and 500, I think. And I don't even, I think the, the, the fine that would, was wiped out too. But anyway, um, just some of those things that you do. But it, it, it's, it's tough when you sit down and you have to levy a penalty against a team, a competitor, a car owner crew, whatever, any NASCAR uh, carrion member. And, and, and I think it's a good thing that you wait a couple of days because when you get caught up in the moment, you get caught up in that moment and, and you're yelling and screaming at each other and unfortunately sometimes it comes to that. Um, things are said that, that were not intended if you, you, know, you want to take those words back and, and, and sometimes you can't. And it, as an official, sometimes you just have to sit there like this and not say a word, or, or sometimes back down a little bit, get a little soft to bring them down as well, or uh, agree with them. I, I, I think I told the story a couple of weeks ago about Bill Park came in screaming and yelling about me, and I'm eating ice cream, I'm sitting there. I went, yeah, Bill, you're right. I messed that one up. Calmed him right down, your eyes, oh, you know, and, and off you go. But the hardest part about penalties, and I used to keep a log book, is you need to be consistent. And, and so far I'm seeing, in, at least in the, in the top three series, NASCAR is being very consistent with their penalties under the new process with the P1s and P2s and whatnot. It's being very consistent. Um, the thing that I don't understand, and, and not that I need to understand it, but I don't understand is this, is you put on probation for whatever, three events, four events, to the end of the season, to the end of the year, and you put on probation. So what does that actually mean? So if you do any other infraction that requires a penalty, didn't you violate your probation? Like if you're a, a criminal and you get released and you're on probation and you break the law again, you go back. You, can't, you go back to jail. NASCAR doesn't seem to do that. Now, I'm not going to get into the, to the particulars. I have a whole list in you. I, I want to be positive, uh, so I'm not going to do that. But, I don't understand that. And then certain crew chiefs on certain teams seem to always be getting themselves into this kind of trouble. Is that a bad thing? No, you know why it's not a bad thing? Because I'm all for ingenuity. I'm all for pushing the envelope. I'm all for a, a, a crew chief, a crew member to be innovative, to get out of that paradigm of this, we do it this way because we always did it this way. Let's make a change. Let's see. 
If they need to make a rule to, to stop us from doing this, so be it. But right now, there isn't a rule that stops us. And in some cases, rules were added based on those things that were, okay, you know what, that's a good idea. We're going to allow that. And, and one of the things that, that I always said from the first time I was a modified official, I didn't like those curved windshields. I said, it doesn't allow a, a trajectory to bounce off it. It sends it into the cockpit. And Brian Chu had that issue with a, with, a, with a motor that blew in front of him. Parts went flying, went through the little opening that this curved windshield had and hit him in the helmet and cracked his helmet. Thank God he had a helmet and he had a darn good helmet at that. But with the flat windshield and all the openings closed, that would have never happened. NASCAR changed the rule and went to windshields that some of the competitors have been asking for. So, and, and like Jay Slicer, Jay Slicer, a longtime crew chief at his local weekly racetrack, now baseball coach, winning championships. He would read the rules to see what he can do and what he can't do. And like Bobby Lane once said, the late Bobby Lane, reading those 24 lines of rules on this one piece of paper. And he says to me, kid, how many lines do you see on that paper? So I'm counting, because I think I have to answer this guy. 24, he goes, well, I see, I see 72. 72, yeah, I see a line above it and a line under it, each one. That's where I fill in the blanks. And I was like, I never looked at it that way. And going back to the 70s when he ran his figure eight car at Isis Speedway, they, the figure eight guys used to bobtail their cars. What does that mean? They cut some of the back end of the car to make it shorter. It was in their head, and you're going through the X, it was less of a target. So the rule said you can only bobtail up to the rear shing, spring shackles. Back then, 99% of the teams ran leaf springs. Spring shackle was right inches away from the rear bumper in the stock position. Bobby Lane comes out, and his car is cut back almost to the rear window. Almost. Officials call him, well, you can't run like that. And he goes, he gets the rule book out right here. Says, I can. What do you mean? Says, I can bobtail it back to the rear spring mounts. I run coilovers. It's that ingenuity. It's stuff like that that, that makes guys do their thing. And uh, yeah, Jay Slice, he's 48. You know, it, it's, it's a rules thing. And, and I was, a, like I said, there's no secret. I wasn't a, a top runner. I wasn't even a mid-pack runner. I raced to have a good time. But I knew how to play the game with rules. And, and I shared some of these rules with people. And, and, and one of the things that stands out in my head you know, is two things. Is when mid-season, my local racetrack, went from American race attires, McQuarrie at the time, to Hoosiers, mid-season. I had a tire sponsor. I had a basement full of tires, because I took my tire money from my tire sponsor, and I bought enough tires for, I don't know, almost the whole season. Now it's mid-season. They changed the rule. I said to the head officials, what am I supposed to do with these other tires? Well, use them in practice. That whole became a whole big argument. And, and one of my guys was sitting in my shop, and we took a grinder. We ground off American races slash McQuarrie. We ground it off, and we took a Hoosier stencil, and we painted it. So when I rolled on a racetrack, it said Hoosier. I knew I was going to be a top three guy and going over the podium. I knew that, so I, I can get away with that. And that's what I did for a half a season. You know, uh, I don't know. The, and, and the other thing I did was they changed the clutch rule mid-season, 1989. I just bought a $700 clutch. And they said that the clutch had to be, the clutch pressure plate flywheel had to be stock and weigh 32 pounds or 30 and a half pounds, whatever it was. And uh, all right, so I went and got, got a stock clutch pressure plate flywheel from, from Roger Maynard. And um, we bolted it to the chassis rail where I had a 25 pound weight. Now the rule didn't say it had to be functioning, it just said I had to have one, and I had one. You know, and technically I just had to have it in a truck because the rule said I have to have one. And yes, oh, here, I have one. And, uh, and, I, and I, got, I got called it. I finished like 11th that night. And um, I'm, I'm pulling off the racetrack, and they stop me at the top of the ramp. They stop me. Go to tech, and I'm like, whoa. I'm saying to myself, there must have been a big scoring error. I'm on the podium. I'm a top three. And when I got there, they wanted my clutch. So we had to go through the motions that we took the clutch out and all that kind of good stuff. And because the headers ran right past where it was bolted, this clutch was very hot. And the head official says, says man, I could have sworn you would have had your 
you had that old, that, that new quartermaster that you had in there. But all right, you're good. And we pushed it on a trailer and went home and bolted it back up. But uh, there, there, was, there was getting Jay slices, taking his 327 blunderbuss mode and boring it to 355. The things that you could do, the things that you could do. And it's, it's, it's all about playing with the rules. It's reading between the lines. And, uh, you know, don't play with safety, you know. But if you want to push that envelope, as a crew chief, as a competitor, that's your job to do. Interpret the rule. Interpret, because it's a rules interpretation. And, you know, an old guy once told me years ago that the, the, the rule book is, is written in soft cover because you have to be flexible. You know, you have to be flexible. And on both ends, and, and, and it's kind of funny, it, it was a rule that stated, uh, and it was in the late models in, in a particular racetrack, and this competitor was, was big on reading between the lines, big time. And he, he had a part that was questionable. Now, you know, I, there was also a rule that said any interpretation of the rule is at the discretion of the official in charge, whether that be me, whether it be my tech guy, whether it's the flagger, well, it's the guy at the gate, who's ever in charge at that moment. So we're questioning this rule. So they come in the office, the driver and the crew chief, and we're sitting there, and I said, listen, I don't know where, what car this came in, but the rule says, I'm going, factory stock. Guy takes the piece of paper up, he goes, yeah, wait, wait, um, factory stock, right? I said, yeah, that part's not factory stock. He says to me, well, it was made in the factory. And when I went and ordered it, they had it in stock. That makes it factory stock. And I was like, you're, you're kidding me. You're kidding me. Now, they got me on that one, but I got them like five times after that on other things. Um, but anyway, it's, it's, it's rules. So. so tonight, where do we go over? Two important things in, 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 as a race team. Don't block the car sponsors in your photo at Victory Lane. And read the rules. Read the rules. Use the rules to your advantage. To your advantage. And, and point out, point out on like rules. And, and I'm not going to give it because you got to do your homework. I know a division at a local racetrack. One of the rules on page, I'll make up a number. Seven. The rule says, you must have blank. Go five pages later. It says, you can never have blank. Who proofreads these rules? Something that was supposed to come out, possibly, that never came out. So now, you get gigged for the one on page six or seven, and you, that's when you go to page you know, 12, and you go, wait, whoa, right here it says this. Now they gotta give you a gimme on that one. They gotta let you slide. So you, you, you have to be able to, you know, how do, how do I say this? You remember, it, it, it's, it's their sandbox, their sand, and it's their shovel to play in the sand. So what you gotta do is you have to not get into it with them. Because think about this. Some of these officials, and, and I'm not going to say all, but some are like, you know, this guy, oh, here he comes again. You don't want to have that. You want to have, hey, what, hey, what's up? What do you want to do? And, and you want to have this, this working relationship. Like, like Ken Sands from Orange County Fair Speedway says, you know, it's like family. And you got to deal with these people every week. Yeah, you're going to have your differences. And you can have situations where, hey, you're not, let's just agree to disagree and move on. It shouldn't be a life-changing event because you're, you're not agreeing. It shouldn't be. So let's just agree to disagree and move on. Yeah, you had your little situation with this tech issue, and yeah, the, your interpretation is this, my interpretation is this. Make it disappear. And I always said to competitors, you know, and, and unless it's a big competitive advantage or a safety issue, I'll give you some time, or I would give them some time to make that change, to fix it, to change it, to whatever. You know, um, it's just one of those things. And like Jay Slice is saying in, the, in the, the, the old blunderbuss division here in Long Island, that no rear weight behind the rear end, so they had a 125-pound rear bumper on their cars. It's not weight, you just have a heavy bumper. You know what I'm saying? Things of that nature. And, and, but it's all about how you interpret it and, and how you go from there. And 
you know, and it's important. And, and don't chintz on the safety stuff, please. If you have a $20 brain, you get a $20 helmet. But if you care about yourself, you, you, go, and get the, you go get the best. So anyway, we're going to take a real quick break. And uh, when we come back, we're going to wrap this up. Oh, I just got, I got the look from the control room. Like, what? <laughs> we'll be right back. <laughs> For over 60 years, Hanson Carpet has put the customer first, providing only the finest quality products and service. And Hanson Carpet is so much more than just carpet. We also carry a wide selection of window blinds and shades, and our licensed and insured technicians can service any of your flooring or window covering needs. Browse our huge selection of laminate, carpet, linoleum, vinyl, and tile. Stop by our showroom today or visit HansonCarpet.com. No matter what your project, Hanson Carpet has got you covered. Hey, this is Chris Lutz Jake, and if inravio.com spots you at an event wearing this bracelet, they will give you $100. What's up, guys? We're Scan Off Fair, and we're here with Inravio. If they catch you at a show with one of these bracelets, you will win 100 bucks. That's a lot of money. So get a bracelet. Do whatever it takes to get that. Hit them up online. <laughs> Hey, uh, we're going to be wrapping up. Uh, just a real quick note, I, I'm scheduled this weekend to go to Norwegia, sweet way down in South Jersey, uh, another dirt track, and uh, actually possibly uh, get some laps in. So I'm going to wear my old fire suit because I don't want my new one to get all muddy and dirty. But uh, that's the plan, uh, to hop in the dirt mod at uh, Norwegia uh, um, this, uh, this Saturday night. So anyway, we're going to wrap it up. And uh, I want to thank everybody for, for, for bearing with us tonight and with our technical issue. But uh, it's all good. Um, and for the hanging in there, and again, this, the chat room will be um, different next week. It will not be this one. So I, I, I hope those who are upset um, um, go have a cup of coffee, relax. It's not coming back, this chat room. I don't like it either. It's, but it's what we had for the last two weeks, and, uh, and you, you go with what you have. Anyway, uh, again, wherever your endeavors are going to take you this week, I, I want everybody to be safe and be, and, and be careful. Uh, Memorial Day weekend, we will, that Monday, we will not have a show so that our, our fans and, and, and employees can enjoy Memorial uh, Day with their family and loved ones. And, and remember those, it's Memorial Day. Remember those people who lost their lives for our great country of, of ours. And uh, um, my son is a career military guy, and, and I thank God every day that uh, he's, he's home on our soil right now. But uh, enjoy this weekend. Remember what it's all about. Be safe. Tell somebody you love them. God bless you all, and thank you.